Um, so uh, let me uh, start by uh, uh, thanking you, uh, uh, Reinhardt, for the uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it's uh, it's an honor to be uh, to be invited uh, uh, to this uh, conference to talk about uh, the euro area, and uh, I'm, I'm going to start by noting that this uh, uh, highlights the continuity of the conference uh, its, uh, uh, itself, uh, and and the fact that the uh, the two economies on uh, on opposite sides of the uh, of the Atlantic has been at the uh, at the focus of attention for uh, for quite some uh, some time, so. Um, what I'm going to uh, talk about uh, today uh, actually uh, takes off uh, where this very conference uh, uh, left uh, at the previous meeting you had in, uh, in Vienna, um, where the, uh, the governor of the uh, Austrian National Bank and, and former uh, colleague of mine on, on the uh, Governing Council of the European Central Bank uh, gave a very enlightening uh, uh, address about uh, the future of European integration. And he highlighted uh, some of the challenges uh, uh, ahead. Um, I, um, I was able to, uh, uh, to, uh, to listen to, uh, uh, to the uh, address, and I was impressed by the fact that he, uh, he ended his remarks by, uh, by noting the political obstacles that must be overcome to further uh, integration in, uh, in Europe. And what I'm going to focus on in, uh, in my talk today is, is precisely uh, those uh, obstacles that I see as interfering with, uh, uh, with uh, the problem and uh, making it uh, rather difficult to come to a, uh, uh, a good uh, uh, conclusion. I have to say that I used to be uh, uh, very optimistic about uh, the euro. Indeed, I was involved in the introduction of the currency in one of the member states. But uh, I have also experienced uh, part of the crisis uh, from the inside. For the past year and a half, I have been watching it from the, uh, from the outside. And I have to admit that as time uh, goes by, I have become uh, more and more uh, uh, pessimistic. So, but uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, is just give you um, uh, my perspective on some of the uh, on some of the difficulties, and, and hopefully um, uh, one of you uh, will be able to uh, to uh, tear the tables around uh, and uh, suggest uh, where the difficulties uh, with uh, with what I see as as major challenges that may be difficult to overcome, may be flawed as I hope they are, uh, so that we can be uh, more optimistic about a, a positive solution going forward. So let me remind you, this crisis did not start in, uh, in Europe. This crisis actually started uh, in the United States. And on this chart, you can see just the unemployment rate of the two largest economies, the US and the Euro area. And you can see that uh, with the uh, uh, Lehman uh, uh, crisis uh, in the, uh, at the end of uh, 2008, and then beginning of 2009, we had a recession that actually was uh, very costly in terms of growth and employment. This shows the unemployment rate uh, around the world. You see an increase uh, in the unemployment rate both in the United States and in the Euro area. But then what started as a very deep uh, recession that I believe was handled uh, very well by authorities at the time with uh, massive uh, policy easing, we had a recovery that uh, started uh, in 2009. And you can see in the blue line is nicely continuing in the United States with a uh, uh, drop in the unemployment rate that uh, I know uh, a lot of people consider too slow and painful. Still, it is considerable progress uh, considering alternative scenario we could have had. But you also see that uh, in, in the euro area, things did not turn out like that. Uh, by uh, by the end of 2010 and 2011 uh, in particular, we, uh, uh, we managed, I say we, the collective we, everybody involved in policy at the time, governments, uh, central banks, uh, everybody, we managed to create another recession uh, in, the, uh, in the euro area. You can see the unemployment rate the, uh, shooting up for, uh, uh, to uh, above 12% uh, and really uh, staying up there even uh, today. 
this, uh, this second recession uh, is, uh, is the uh, part of the consequences we can see of the phase of the crisis that we can associate it with, that we can associate with, uh, with the euro area. Uh, did not start in, uh, in Europe, but policy decisions in Europe managed to transform what was a manageable and I believe well managed uh, initially uh, crisis into an existential crisis for the euro area that we are still experiencing uh, uh, today. Um, in this picture, you do not really see uh, the pain that has been uh, involved. Uh, the crisis has had uh, severe social dimensions. Just show you briefly uh, just a few pictures, country by country. You start with, with Greece, where we had fires in Athens, where the fire bombing of a, of a bank branch, uh, 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 a little bit more peaceful in, uh, in, in Ireland. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, country after country, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, issues uh, in, uh, in Portugal, uh, always more mellow uh, than, uh, than in the Mediterranean. You can see that. Uh, yeah, as, as you move closer to on the other side of the sea, again, you see the smoke. Uh, the latest episode in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Cyprus. And these pictures don't really tell you uh, much about what is going underneath. What we have been experiencing the last four years, really, is a disintegration of the, uh, of the euro area. And that you can see if you focus, for example, on the uh, unemployment rates. And uh, what I have on this slide is, uh, is the unemployment rates for uh, Germany on one end, uh, the country at the core uh, of, uh, of Europe. And uh, at, um, um, you can compare this, the red line, you can compare it with the, with the unemployment rate and how it has evolved in the so-called program countries. These are all of the countries that are currently uh, in, uh, in uh, some form of an IMF uh, European Commission program uh, over the past uh, uh, four years. What you can see here, just to make a brief comparison, if you look at the unemployment rates since the beginning of the euro area, 1999, they were not as divergent. You can uh, see the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the recession affecting negatively almost all economies but not Germany. If you actually look at the unemployment rate in Germany before the recession, 2006, 2007, before the crisis, it was the highest of the ones uh, shown here. Uh, the uh, unemployment rate in Germany has been virtually declining continuously during the uh, uh, crisis. And then you see uh, the other countries, one by one, as they fall into a crisis, how the unemployment rates shoot up. And this is going to give you a, a, a better indication of the social consequences uh, that, uh, that are faced uh, on the ground in some member states. This divergence is what is breaking the euro area apart. From this picture, if you don't look at any other picture, if you just look at this picture alone, one might even uh, make the suggestion that perhaps uh, uh, the crisis in Europe has been managed uh, uh, as if one were solving an optimal control problem for the German economy ignoring everybody else. At least from this picture, uh, someone might, uh, might make that, uh, that claim. And that's, it, that's not a nice claim to, uh, to make. This is not how the euro area should, uh, uh, should work. In any case, this is the total unemployment rate, so it, it, it still doesn't quite give you the magnitude uh, of, the, uh, of the social issues uh, uh, in the background. To get a, a better feel for it, I have another uh, picture here, same countries, uh, the unemployment rates. And here, I, I want you to focus on the scale. We're talking about uh, unemployment rates uh, uh, for uh, the young. These are unemployment rates in the population ages 25 and under. And uh, if you look at the scale, uh, you, uh, uh, you can see for Spain and Greece, for example, we're talking about 55 to 60 percent of the young uh, are are unemployed, have been unemployed. And you can see for the other program countries, uh, uh, one third of the population or more has been unemployed. 
it's not clear uh, if uh, the prospects uh, are that great that this will be reversed in a hurry. And uh, unfortunately, we do know so from some studies that, uh, that uh, uh, these uh, spells of unemployment uh, for the young uh, can actually have long-term scarring episodes. One of the tragedies is that even if we manage to solve this thing, we may have already lost a generation. So the usual picture you can see about uh, how this is uh, described is by, is by focusing on the disintegration of the financial markets. This is what everybody has been, has been focusing on uh, to evaluate the crisis. Uh, so what I have on this slide is, uh, is the two-year government bond yields for the four largest member states. Looking at the four largest member states uh, is sufficient to tell you that what we are facing is a systemic problem that doesn't really have to do with what happened in Greece, for example, or what happened in Ireland. Uh, in this chart, knows that uh, the, lar the four largest economies are Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, in that order. These four, by the way, are about 80% uh, of the GDP in the, uh, in the euro area. So if, uh, if you see a problem in these four economies, you don't really need to, uh, to examine in great detail the, uh, the other economies to see, uh, to see what's going on. The two-year rate is the, uh, uh, is the rate that is uh, usually seen as a good proxy for monetary policy. And you can see from the divergences in the, uh, uh, in the two-year government yields here that uh, one of the difficulties the ECB has been facing, that it no longer controls the transmission policy for much of the euro area. So we do have a common uh, monetary policy in the euro area. Monetary policy in the euro area from this chart alone, if, even if you don't look at anything else, works reasonably well in France and Germany. You would have expected, as Reinhardt mentioned, we have a number of economies in the world where policy rates are essentially at zero or very close to zero. And this is appropriate uh, in, 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 in the light of the macroeconomic conditions we have had. But then if you ask yourself, OK, so uh, is this so in uh, Spain and, uh, and Italy, you say, no, actually, it's, it's a complete failure. In 2011, in 2012, we had severe tightenings of, of policy conditions in these countries. And these are the countries that actually had rising unemployment much more than France and Germany. And already for Germany, as I've shown you before, the unemployment rate has been falling. Uh, so this is part of, uh, of the picture that tells you we have a problem. The problem is not according to this data, as severe as it was uh, uh, in uh, mid-2011 or mid-2012. But despite all of the talk we've heard uh, uh, recently about uh, 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 the crisis being behind us, frankly, uh, when I look at a picture like this, uh, it doesn't look like that to me. Um, so why is the Euro project crashing to earth? Is the problem a fiscal problem, what, what originally showed up in, uh, in Greece with uh, high deficits, perhaps manipulation of statistics, unsustainable debt, and so forth? Or is it a competitiveness program, uh, problem, what we've seen in, in Portugal, for example, where we had uh, relatively high wage increases uh, uh, without uh, the accompanying uh, productivity uh, increases? Is it a banking problem? what we've seen in, in Ireland, uh, for example, uh, early on. We have a number of these uh, elements that are clearly parts of describing what has happened in the past five years. But I would argue that none of these things is really responsible as a cause, as a primary cause, for the fact that for five years now, the euro area is in a crisis and cannot get out of it. These are, in my view, symptoms of a, of a deeper flaw that can't really be solved with, uh, with technical arguments as the other ones could be. You know, if you have a technical argument, you, know, you go to, to Washington, to the IMF, you get some experts, they tell you, fine, cut your budget, done, deal. Within three years after following uh, religiously a program, you are supposed to be, uh, to be back in the game and healthy. That's not what we have in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. 
And this actually influencing policy even today, flawed narratives can be very misleading to, uh, to policy makers. Having um, experts uh, deal with symptoms, why the underlying causes of a, uh, of a problem, may actually make the problem worse, as I think it has. And, uh, and also lead to irresponsible, in my view, complacency, uh, which I believe we, uh, we also have observed uh, in spades in, uh, in the Euro area. What we have, in my view, is, uh, is really a clear case of, uh, of crisis mismanagement. Uh, I, I mentioned here two examples I will, I will briefly uh, review. Um, remember, we're in a financial crisis, among other things. The last thing you would want to do in a financial crisis is inject additional risk in any financial instruments whatsoever. I highlight here two decisions that were really dramatic. Uh, the first one, October 18, 2010, in Deauville, the decision to introduce credit risk in what used to be considered, before that date, safe government debt. That was a conscious decision, that someone made that decision. It was not an accident. And then the decision earlier this year, March 16, 2013, the decision to introduce credit risk in what used to be considered safe bank deposits up to that point. Again, a conscious decision. This one, you know, you may argue this decision was taken at 4 a.m. in the morning. One of the finance ministers involved uh, later said that he was uh, asleep uh, during the meeting. So, yeah, this one at 4 a.m. in the morning you can actually perhaps justify uh, in, in some way. I, I don't find those excuses uh, valid uh, when you're in a crisis uh, uh, situation. So we have these situations that uh, the governments in Europe have been describing as unique and exceptional. Greece had a unique and exceptional problem. Ireland had a unique and exceptional problem, and so forth and so forth, all requiring unique and exceptional solutions. And uh, we can call these unique and exceptional blunders, but then, but then ask ourselves, why do we see so many of them? What's causing them? And a good explanation is that uh, these blunders uh, may have been simply the outcome of uh, incompetent advisors. And that's a good explanation in, in my view, uh, because if it were true, it can be corrected. You know, just get better advisors who know what they're doing. We have a lot of them uh, in, the, in the world, in, in our profession. Another explanation that, uh, that uh, worries me much more is that these blunders are a predictable manifestation of the decision-making process itself in the, uh, uh, in the Euro area. And if that's so, then it may not be so trivial to, uh, to solve the problem we've been living through in the last uh, few years. You could ask how things could get so bad. Um, I'll remind you the euro was incomplete by design. There was no crisis uh, management mechanism in place. People knew that when it was put together. It was a political problem when it was put together. The success of the euro rested, and this was recognized by the founding uh, fathers, uh, if you wish to accept that terminology, um, on the uh, belief or hope, whichever you prefer, that if and when a crisis erupted, then governments would work together towards completing the project. And this is what uh, Ewald Novotny was talking to you about in, in April, talking about you know, how you can go forward and what are the challenges that need to be, uh, to be uh, uh, overcome. In the last few years, this belief proved misplaced. So here's where I, I think we, we need to look a little bit more closely at what the political constraints and incentives are. And here, again, in, in your society, you are uh, very well placed to do comparisons that I find myself making all the time. How does the euro area compare to the United States, another large economy, another common market, uh, with different states working together that doesn't quite have these problems? And one of the key differences is that Europe is not a federal state, so there is no single government that can enforce any, any solutions. Solutions on, on, on issues that may involve adjusting the treaty, 
require unanimous agreement by the governments of the member states. And governments of the member states face their own electorates. They have very different incentives from the incentives necessary to internalize any possible negative externalities that might arise uh, from, from some of the uh, uh, suggestions. Uh, a, a good solution may be unpopular in the short run to the electorate in some state and may be vetoed by the government of that state. On top of that, uh, recall that uh, Europe is formed by a set of democracies. And this is great because democracy is the best uh, polity uh, we, uh, uh, we can have. However, that creates the problem that uh, each government needs to face uh, elections. And we have different election cycles. They vary from, from, from state to state. This does create uh, this unfortunate element that, that uh, at any given moment, uh, a government of a member state may prefer to postpone decisions that would solve the crisis, or even misuse a problem for local political gain. And these are the constraints that are built into how, how Europe works. Now, what has happened, uh, and this is Evald had talked about this in his remarks uh, in, in April uh, to some extent, we have had um, um, mismanagement of the crisis in the sense that the Deauville decision I, I highlighted before damaged sovereign markets of Euro area member states perceived to be uh, weak. And as a result, some Euro area member states face much higher government bond yields, as I've shown you, for example, for, for Spain and, and Italy. This actually got worse in 2011 uh, as a result of the fact that holdings of government bonds by banks weakened the capital positions of those, uh, of those uh, banks. And this created a negative feedback loop between banks and sovereigns that is really responsible for the recession we've been through uh, in the last uh, uh, two years uh, and the continuing uh, damage uh, for uh, economies in a number of, uh, of countries. So let me very briefly touch on what happened in Deauville. This was a, uh, uh, a meeting uh, between uh, President Sarkozy and, uh, and Chancellor Merkel where the uh, French and German governments, on their own, without really asking their governments, uh, took a decision to uh, introduce uh, credit risk in markets by uh, uh, adopting the so-called private sector involvement doctrine. Remarkably, the other governments, uh, in, a, in a meeting just a few days later, did not object to this. They felt they were not in a sufficiently strong position to, uh, to object to this crazy idea, even though there were warnings and objections by the ECB. And the president of the ECB is attending these meetings. Uh, and uh, we, we know that uh, at the very meeting where, where this decision was actually uh, accepted by everybody, they were warned. So what was this concept about? This concept said that whenever a euro area member state faced a liquidity pressure, not a solvency issue, first, losses would be imposed on private creditors, and then, a potential loan would be considered for the country involved. And this totally switched around the usual uh, rules that the IMF uses, for example, for, for providing uh, temporary uh, assistance. And the message was very clear to potential investors that uh, euro area sovereign debt should no longer be considered safe. And this was actually seen in markets uh, uh, very quickly. The introduction of, of credit risk raised the uh, cost of financing for a number of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Euro area member states, actually most of them. There was a, a casualty uh, very quickly after that. Ireland, uh, that was in a tough position, lost access within weeks of that decision. That was followed by Portugal. Not, I'm not talking about Greece. I'm not even emphasizing at all what had happened before. That was an isolated episode that could have been uh, treated, and the crisis could have been over by the end of, uh, uh, of 2010. I'm talking about subsequent decisions that made this a systemic uh, uh, problem. And this PSI doctrine is what generated the adverse feedback loop between sovereigns and, uh, and banks. Note 
that even though this was a blunder for the euro area as a whole, the PSI doctrine proved beneficial to Germany, the country that actually uh, proposed it. And this was perhaps the first, I don't think it was the first uh, indication, but it was the first uh, very serious indication of an adversarial approach to the crisis uh, that was taking hold among the member uh, uh, states. And you may ask, okay, so we have an issue with, uh, with some governments. What about European institutions in, in this? And ideally, European institutions could try to play the role of uh, serving the, uh, the interests of Europe as a whole. European institutions being the European Commission that is there uh, to ensure that the treaty uh, is enforced, the ECB, the, uh, the central bank uh, that, that controls monetary policy for the euro area as a whole. In practice, because Europe is just a loose confederation, European institutions do not have the authority to solve this problem. And there is a, um, uh, a perverse role that, that might actually uh, appear in that the attempt, the very attempt to preserve the euro at all costs may create the risk of political capture by uh, the European institutions, which may then become counterproductive. You may have specific uh, member states that could misuse the crisis for local political gain over and above the objections of these institutions. And these institutions may see that as still the best uh, possible way to avoid a collapse uh, and, uh, and hope that a solution may be found uh, later on. And indirectly, uh, European institutions may actually become count counterproductive uh, as a result of this. So these are the problems. You can say, you know, but there must be solutions to this. Uh, well, Indeed, in terms of technical solutions, there are technical solutions involved. Uh, as, uh, as Evald Novotny had explained to you in, uh, in, in April, uh, at the moment, the most obvious threat remains the uh, adverse uh, feedback loop between sovereigns and banks. And this could be solved. It could have already been solved by creating a banking union. And indeed, we came close to that. In, uh, in the summer of 2012, concerns about the survival of the, of the euro brought governments uh, in the euro area very close to, uh, to an agreement on this, uh, especially the, uh, the decision that was taken at the June 29th summit uh, was, uh, was quite important. The governments agreed to uh, set up a banking union to break, in quotes, because they recognized the problem, the vicious circle between banks and sovereigns. But it didn't materialize. So here's what the announcement uh, of the governments uh, was. We affirm that it is imperative to break the vicious circle between banks and sovereigns. We affirm our strong commitment to do what is necessary to ensure the financial stability of the euro area, in particular by using the existing EFSF ESM instruments in a flexible and efficient manner in order to stabilize markets. Beautiful words. Unfortunately, they just stayed at the words. Because in order to do this, uh, the banking union needs three elements. You need banking, you need uh, banking supervision that's going to be common to, uh, to all banks. You need a common deposit guarantee scheme. You need a common resolution mechanism. What you need really is uh, something like an FDIC combination, FDIC Fed combination that, that exists in the United States. You need something equivalent to that in the euro area to stabilize the, uh, the, uh, uh, the system. Uh, without uh, these, uh, uh, these three elements, uh, you can't really uh, get anywhere. So sufficiently concerned about the survival of the euro, uh, the, uh, the governments uh, directed uh, four of the numerous presidents uh, of the European Union to come up with a plan that would be implemented and get us out of the crisis. We had uh, the, uh, the results of that uh, be published uh, in December. And here are the four presidents who were assigned this task, president of the European Council, president of the European Commission, president of the Eurogroup, president of the European Central Bank. They issued a report explaining what had to be uh, done, putting out a, a timetable and, uh, and everything that was done. 
it wasn't implemented. Why? Well, it was blocked by the German government because by the time this report was ready, the ECB had introduced uh, the uh, OMT, the Outright Monetary Transactions uh, uh, tool, that actually uh, resolved the immediate threat to, uh, to the euro area. So uh, the German government didn't really worry about uh, a crash of the euro as of uh, yet. And indeed, for over a year, the German elections that just happened in September of 2013 had become a constraint in, in any and all action in, uh, in Europe. Why is that? Because some of the elements needed to make progress in, uh, in this direction uh, were opposed by uh, German banking interests and were not popular in Germany. And again, you have the issue of national considerations influencing a government, and unfortunately, a government can veto any progress, and that pretty much stopped the progress. Progress wasn't needed to solve a particular immediate problem faced by the German economy. The progress was needed to solve an immediate problem that was faced by half a dozen or more other economists in the, uh, in the uh, euro area. So pretty much the problem was that solving the crisis in, in 2012, as could have occurred, would have compromised uh, the chancellor's re-election. And it didn't happen. This is why I'm, I'm actually uh, quite concerned about uh, whether solutions can be implemented. Because in Europe, there are many presidents, but there is no individual who can take a presidential uh, decision. Effectively, uh, any government can block things. And some governments can actually use, if you wish, exploit the, uh, the veto power to leverage the flaw in the system to serve local short-sighted political uh, interests, regardless of what the cost is for, for Europe uh, uh, as a whole. And here's where, again, I think about the European institutions and the helplessness that must be felt, because they know the problem, they see Europe as a whole, and they don't have the power to fix it. And they're just caught in the, uh, uh, in the middle. And this is what is causing, I believe, the repeated I might say, predictable blunders that we keep uh, uh, seeing. So we saw another, another one uh, in, in March. This is the second one uh, I, I'd like to highlight, the introduction of credit risk in deposits. How did this come about? You know, who knew what Cyprus was? It's a tiny, tiny island. 0.2% uh, of the euro area entered the euro in, in 2008, and yes, I uh, I am to blame for facilitating that back in, uh, in 2007. The island had a, a large banking system with large Greek uh, exposure. They actually had a stable currency and, and finances so that were just fine before your entry. The problem that uh, started in Cyprus by having a communist government that took power just, just two months after, after the island joined the, uh, the euro area. And this government actually made a mess of the place, with, uh, first with overspending and then with the politics of the Cypriot election in February 2013. The date is important, February 2013. But you could say, OK, fine. This date may give you a hint why the crisis was created in March of 2013. Fine. But why did it have to be so bad? And to understand that, you really need to understand the politics of the German election in September of 2013 again, because unfortunately, the two are linked. Could you see this crisis coming? Uh, well, uh, I could. Anybody with a Bloomberg terminal could. Um, I could from Cyprus, and I could even when I came back to the United States. What I have in this, uh, in this slide is, uh, is a picture of the five-year credit default swaps on, uh, on sovereign debt. Uh, the picture is daily data ending at the end of, uh, of February of 2013. And you can see, uh, you know, for Greece, Greece is out of this world. So you really need to cut the, uh, the axis, otherwise you can't see anything. Uh, but you can see that for any country that got in trouble, 
This is reflected uh, pretty well uh, in, uh, uh, in the CDS uh, market. When you have the CDS uh, reaching 500, 600%, this is like adding a five to six percentage point premium on, uh, uh, on government debt that is being issued. This is an indication that, uh, that difficulties are in order and the, and the uh, government may, may be losing market access. What happens in those instances is that the government asks for assistance enters into a program and fixes the issue. Well, what, uh, what made Cyprus unique was then delay in doing that. The communist government refused at all costs to, uh, uh, to do what every other government would have done. What on this slide is the same data as in the previous one. Uh, and I have a, uh, a triangle noting the day on which a government asked for assistance for the IMF and the EU. And I have a, uh, a dot on the day that the program was finalized, signed, agreed, and the implementation started. And you can see for every other country when, uh, when the data, when the CDS go to five, 600 percent, assistance is sought. When assistance is sought, uh, within a few weeks, three to five weeks, usually a program is, uh, is signed uh, and, and the whole thing is done. In the case of Cyprus, the government lost access, uh, market access in May of 2011, but refused to even ask for assistance. You can see the triangle uh, is in June of 2012. You can see the, tri the triangle at the, at, the, at the top. The triangle actually is on the same day when Spain asked for assistance. Spain and Cyprus asked for assistance on the same day. In the case of Spain, a program was, uh, was finalized within three weeks, as expected. In the case of Cyprus, the government refused to discuss anything. And uh, it wasn't finalized until they left office at the end of February. That's why you don't see a dot on this chart. So uh, what happened is, uh, is that instead of uh, uh, asking for assistance and fixing the problem, the uh, communist government in Cyprus uh, got a uh, bilateral loan from Russia that was calculated to just shore up its finances until the election. And this is one of the reasons why March was the crash, because they timed everything to push it beyond the election. If that wasn't bad enough, in October of 2011, the Cypriot government agreed to the PSI on the, uh, uh, on the Greek debt without actually negotiating anything with the, uh, with the EU partners, as they should have. And that imposed a 25% of GDP capital loss on the banks. That was still manageable, but uh, uh, it did not stay manageable for, for long because uh, starting in May of 2012, the government and the central bank started a coordinated campaign against the banking system that the communist government used to run the elections uh, that, uh, that it faced in, uh, in February. You could say, what can the central bank do? It can do a lot of things. Started investigations against the banks with uh, leaks to the media. It started describing the banking model in Cyprus as casino banking. I don't know of any, any supervisor in the rest of the world who, during a crisis, would say, you know, our banking system is a casino system. We should shut it down. And it actually forced banks to book accounting losses in order to make uh, the, uh, the capital needs uh, seem bigger than they were, because this is what the government needed to use to claim that uh, what Cyprus had was a banking problem, not a fiscal problem that it had already for two years uh, 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 earlier. So uh, the Communist Party lost the election, but with a campaign against the banking system, they actually managed to convince the rest of the world that if what the government and the central bank were telling was true, then perhaps there was an issue with uh, the sustainability of the debt, the thing we are all worried about. And this is what set up the, uh, the bad outcomes uh, that we saw in, in March. So why were the September 2013 elections so critical for determining just how bad the outcome would, uh, uh, would be? This is because the delay in the program really pushed it into the election uh, cycle in, in Germany. Had the Cypriot government uh, accepted a program even in June of, 20, of 2012, alongside with Spain, or earlier, in 2011, there wouldn't have been 
uh, an issue like the one you've seen uh, this, uh, uh, this March. But what you had in, uh, in this case was that uh, the election in Germany heated up and, uh, and uh, any program, any loan, anywhere uh, in, the, in, the European, uh, in the Euro area became an issue for that election. And there is something special about uh, the German government that, that we had. Uh, in that the Chancellor's party actually needed support from its main opposition party to pass any European legislation, because the junior partner in the Chancellor's uh, government uh, until recently was uh, opposing uh, anything that would be pro-Europe. And this support was, uh, uh, was obtained, so the, uh, the SPD supported the CDU uh, uh, with regard to Greece, Ireland, uh, Portugal, and then Spain. But as uh, they were getting closer to the election, they wanted to take a tougher stand to create political cost for the chancellor for any decisions like that. And this became a major issue when German politicians started claiming that helping Cyprus is equivalent to, this is a quote, giving away German taxpayer money to Russian oligarchs who have deposits in Cypriot banks. Mind you, there are more Russian oligarchs and more Russian deposits by those oligarchs in Germany, but who cares about the facts here? The, the point is what makes for good, uh, for good uh, uh, politics. A uh, particularly damaging but uh, uh, a good summary uh, of the problems the Chancellor was facing showed up in, in, uh, uh, in November. I, uh, my German, as I was explaining to Reinhardt earlier, is very poor, so I have to rely on the English translations uh, uh, when I can find them. You can see this, this summarizes the whole thing. EU aid for Cyprus, a political minefield for Merkel. Oops, can't do this. If you were to actually do a normal program for Cyprus, you would compromise your re-election. What do you do? Luckily, there was a solution for the German government. And the solution was very simple. What you could do is uh, veto any solution that would not uh, do permanent damage to the financial sector in Cyprus, and if possible, propose a solution that could be described as imposing losses on, on the Russian depositors. Because this way, the German government could deflect uh, any of the criticisms uh, it was getting from the opposition party and could turn the argument uh, in, in, in her favor for, uh, for the election. And this could be justified simply by using the language that was used by the communist government, the central bank, in, in Cyprus. So it was beautiful. This is what actually happened uh, and uh, in, uh, in uh, German election uh, campaign rallies, uh, we could see uh, the, uh, the reasoning with the chancellor saying, for example, anyone having their, deposit, their money in Cypriot banks must contribute in the Cypriot bailout. That way, those responsible, the depositors, will contribute in it, not only the taxpayers of other countries. And that is what's right. Well, you know, if you speak to a campaign rally, that's what you have to say. But uh, it was uh, more revealing was, uh, was the finance minister's remarks uh, later on about the role of the, of the euro. When, when the finance minister said, we don't like this business model and we hope it is not successful. That's, by the way, a similar remark they made for Ireland uh, earlier in the crisis. But what's really revealing here is to say uh, later on the sentence, in the case of Cyprus, we have leverage that we don't have with other tax havens. So let's use it. This is how Europe works. This is what led to the uh, Eurogroup um, blunder in, uh, uh, in March, uh, on March uh, uh, 16. Uh, I, uh, I know you're, you're familiar with, uh, with the decisions uh, uh, there. There was a decision to just haircut deposits everywhere that uh, pretty much uh, did permanent damage to the banking system. The German government was celebrating right after that the periphery was, was, of course, pressured. It was much like the Deauville blunder. This was a wonderful solution for the German government, but the decision-making process we have in the background. 
can you actually have a solution? Can the European institutions come up with a solution that would pass the political feasibility test at the moment? And personally, I find this unlikely without fundamental political reform in Europe. And of course, many, many recognize the need for political reform in Europe. But is it feasible to expect political reform in Europe under the circumstances? Well, and again, I view this as highly unlikely with the current configuration of leaders and uh, governments. And that's what I'm going to leave you with. Uh, we have uh, uh, a picture of the 10-year uh, the sovereign debt. Um, a lot of people try to look at this data. This is daily data as of uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, thank you. And uh, a lot of people look at this data and they say, look, the divergences uh, are subsiding. We, the crisis is behind us, many, uh, many say. And, and frankly, when, when I look at this picture, it's not clear to me what is behind us. I mean, the, the spreads we have right now, and this is, again, Spain and Italy versus France and, and, uh, uh, and Germany. I'm not talking about the tiny countries that, uh, that have been crushed uh, already. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the four largest countries. The spreads we see, we see here are still unsustainable, and it's not clear uh, what... Uh, what basis we might have for the uh, long-term uh, survival uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the euro. But I would like to be an optimist, so I hope you're going to give me a good reason uh, to be more optimistic than I currently are uh, in the Q&A session, perhaps. Thank you.